Oh man, hey, I want to give a shout out to all the different folks at different locations. All of our East Campus family, where y'all at? Make some noise, all of you guys. All of our North Campus family, where are you guys at? Come on, make some noise. And then let's all give a lot of love to everybody who's tuned in and is watching right now. Come on, let them hear you. Tell them how much you appreciate them. Yeah, we love you and appreciate you. Well, today is going to be a fun day as we get into the Word of God. I just want to go ahead and say that this message, for some of you, you might be thinking as we get into this. Now, wait a minute. I, I was expecting kind of the Easter story. This is going to be the story of Jesus, and we're going to be talking about this for the next four or five weeks. And so I'm really excited about the message, and it really starts with when I was nine years old, something that my parents got me for my birthday. When I was nine years old, I got one of these guys right here. I got a Rubik's Cube. Now, how many of you guys grew up in the 80s when these things rolled around and, and you got your cube? Yeah, come on, yeah, y'all get a little rowdy over a Rubik's Cube, y'all know. Yeah, you know how it is. Uh, these things seem real simple. You know, it's like you keep all the red on the red side, and then there's a white side, and a yellow, and a green, and an orange, and a blue, and you just got to keep everything in its place, and that's the simplicity of the Rubik's Cube. But, after I made a few wrong turns, what seemed real simple became really complicated. Now, my mom and dad, they had at that time a Victorian-style living room suit. And uh, they had a coffee table that was about way, yay wide, still have it, in a guest room upstairs. And one day, getting so frustrated over this complicated mess that I had created, I got frustrated, slung this thing across the house, and kicked and broke the coffee table. There's a, there's a leg still glued together. From that break that day. And I want to say to you that my mom about beat the tar out of me, all right? And uh, my kids, now I got the best mom and dad anybody could imagine having. And the best mother and father-in-law that anybody could imagine having. But there was a mean streak in there at one time. She got so mad at me over breaking that thing. This thing right here got me beat near death. And this thing about drove me nuts. If you had a Rubik's Cube, you know what I'm talking about. Well, everybody at school had one. Everybody in my neighborhood had one. And, and it was all a race to see who could get this thing right, who could fix it first. So I did what you all did. We got some sticker peelers in this room, I guarantee it. Well, I went home one day, and I snuck off when nobody was looking, and I peeled every single sticker off, and I put it on the edge of my nightstand, and when nobody was looking, I started putting all the blue stickers on one side and all the yellow on one side, and from a distance, my cube looked real good. But when you got up on it, something was fishy about my cube. It has some fuzz sticking out from a few of the little stickers. Some of the stickers weren't real square. It looked good from a distance, but get up on it and you knew something wasn't right with it. Well, not only did I get one of these when I was nine years old, it was at the age of nine that something happened in my life that I still remember today. I'm 43 years old, and as you can see, 31 years, and I still hadn't figured this thing out. I guarantee you if we went back to your house where you grew up, your mom and dad, your granny, grandpa, whoever it was that raised you, there's a toy box in an attic that has one of these in it that you fiddled with for a while. Well, at nine years old, something else happened, and I will never, ever forget what happened. I sinned my first big sin. And my mom and dad, they don't, even, they don't even know about what I did. I'm not going to tell either. <laughs> But it was the first time I ever did something really, really, really bad. And I remembered it. I remember it so much so that in the background that night, there was a song playing. And to this day, when I'm cruising through stations looking for something to listen to, and, I, and it lands on that song, or when I'm at a restaurant or I'm at the mall, when I hear the song playing in the background, to this day, 31 years later, it's like a blanket of shame covers me. Because of what I did. That night when I did what I did, it was like something. I couldn't explain it. I was only nine years old. But it was like something grew cold inside of me. It was like something in me died. I felt for the first time a disconnect. I remember feeling fear. 
fear that I wasn't going to go to heaven because of what I did. I felt shame. I felt regret. Instantly. Instantly. That's forever embedded in my mind. My mom... The next morning, I couldn't sleep all night. I stayed up all night. I was, I was just, just disgusted with what, I've, what I had done. Have you ever went into doing something that you knew wasn't right and you did it anyway and, and maybe you thought it was a good deal at the time, but after you did it, you regretted doing it the very moment? You ever been there? And you feel sick because of it. Well... I remember the next morning, I did at some point in the night fall asleep. And the next morning, my mom was in the kitchen. And I could hear the bacon on the skillet. In the skillet, I could smell it. I, she was making gravy and biscuits. And I could smell that gravy. I could smell the biscuits. And I woke up and I ran into the kitchen. And I asked my mom, I said, I said Mom, how do you know that you're going to go to heaven? I'll never forget what she said to me. I don't know if she remembers this. But she said, you ask Jesus to forgive you of the wrong that you've done. And ask him to come into your heart. Now, part B didn't make a lot of sense to me. I didn't know how big Jesus got somehow into, or, or the little felt Jesus got off the felt board and into my heart. But, but, you know, that didn't make a lot of sense. But it was so simple, the first part of that, ask Jesus to forgive you of the wrong that you've done. So as much as a nine-year-old could, as sincere as I could pray at nine years old, I ran back into, without even getting a piece of bacon, I ran back into my bedroom, knelt down, and I said, Jesus, please forgive me for what I had done last night. And as far as I was concerned, it was a done deal. It was settled. But then came my teenage years. Then came junior high. And in junior high, what seemed simple started getting complicated because I made a few more wrong turns. Are y'all with me? And it started getting a little messier. And then by the time I was in high school, even as a freshman, some of those wrong turns turned into addiction. And then I found myself on the sinful go-round, not the merry-go-round because there's nothing merry about the sinful go-round. The sinful go-round is when you're stuck in this sin cycle and something inside of you, deep inside of you, has convinced you you can never get off. You can never be free. You're doomed. You're stuck there. The addictions are too big. I want to give a shout out to Jacqueline who is right there who's 129 days clean. Yes. Yes. Who led a Bible study Friday night. Yes. Come on. Got off the sinful go-round. And I was on the sinful go-round. By the time I was a freshman in high school, those wrong turns became addictions. And so here's what Jesus became to me. To me, the Christian faith, to me, church, to me, Jesus, God, everything was about me getting right. Maybe you've heard somebody say, maybe you've even said, you need to get right. You ever heard that? What does that mean? How does one get right? In my mind, we get right. I got right by righting all the wrong turns. And I want to say to you that that drove me nuts. I was going crazy. I remember feeling like I'm losing my mind. Because this right here is so hard. This is driving me up the wall. And just like I tossed this, I tossed Jesus too. Because in my mind, I thought, if this is the good news, if this is the gospel, if this is what Jesus came for, if this is the story of, of God, then I'm, I can't deal with that. I remember praying a prayer when I was a young man, and my prayer went something like this. God, I don't want to go to hell. But if this is heaven, I opt to die and cease to exist, because that is more like hell to me than heaven. That is complicated. So today, I got good news. Number one, we're going to talk today about the one thing Jesus came to do. The one thing Jesus Christ came to do is he came to take a complicated religious system and simplify it. Jesus came to make it easy for us to connect with the Father again. Jesus came to simplify everything. Now today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start in the book of Genesis and we're going to go all the way through the Bible to the book of Revelation. We're going to go on a story journey today through the entire Bible and we're going to do it and get this 20 minutes or less. And you say, oh man, come on now. A preacher's up on the 
pulpit, man, I, I got my doubts about that one right there. Well, look at your neighbor and say, uh, I got 10 bucks, he can do it. <laughs> All right? We're going to try. We're going to try. It might be 21, but hang with me for a minute. We're going to start in the book of Genesis. We're going to end in the book of Revelation. We're going to talk about the one thing Jesus came to do. He came to simplify everything. He came to take a complicated religious system and make it easy. So, let's talk about where this story starts. It starts in the book of Genesis. God made us. God made mankind. He put us in a garden called Eden. Everybody say Eden. Eden, Eden has an interesting meaning. Eden has two meanings. One is paradise. Now, I want you to put your thinking cap on with me. Everybody put your thinking cap on because you're really going to have to think with me today. All right, not everybody did that. So, here's, here's, how, I, here's how I roll. If you, if you don't do what I say, I think you didn't hear me. I'm just going to keep repeating myself over and over and over. We'll never get this done in 20 minutes. So, everybody put your thinking cap on. All right. So, God put man in a place called Eden, which means paradise. It was like heaven. It was never God's will that you die and go somewhere else. It was never a part of God's plan. We talk about people dying and going to heaven. That was never God's plan. This was heaven. So God would come down in Eden, paradise, and He would walk with Adam face to face, walk with Eve face to face, just like you and I take a stroll together. It was paradise. Eden also means a place full of pleasure. Now, if you were to go back to when I was struggling with this right here, and you would have said, hey, Jason, guess what? God wants to add to your life pleasure. I'd say, no, 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 no. God is a pleasure taker. That's what I thought. But that's not the case at all. He put us in a heaven place, Eden, and it was a place full of pleasure. And now get this, man. He said there's only one rule. I don't want you to think about right and wrong, good and evil. And you say, now wait a second, I thought the rule was don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't, it wasn't that God didn't want them to taste an apple, if that's what the fruit was. He didn't care that their taste buds lit up when they took a bite of a certain type of fruit. No, it was that He didn't want them to consume this battle between right and wrong, good and evil. He did not want this to become the focal point of their life. So he said, I'm putting you in a heavenly place full of pleasure. And here's the rule. Don't think about right and wrong, good and evil. Now, as I say those words, something in me says, now wait a second. Wait a second. Doesn't, doesn't integrity count? Yes. Doesn't God want us to be morally good people? Yes. Yes, He does. But your hands do and your feet carry you and your mouth talks about and your mind contemplates whatever has your heart. Whatever has your heart has everything else. And so today I've got a few points I want to make. And here's the first one. Christianity is not about perfection. It's about affection. Christianity is not about living morally perfect. It's about having a heart that is wrapped up in a love affair with Jesus Christ. Come on, man. Yeah. Because whatever has your heart, has your hands, has your feet, has your eyes, has your ears. Has everything else. Your hands do and your feet go wherever your heart carries them. Now I want you to think about this. I'm going to keep that thinking cap on. The word holiness. I don't know if anybody's ever heard somebody talk about holiness. Living holy, being holy. The Bible even says that we are to be holy as God is holy. And I don't know what your definition would be of holiness. If I started right here with Pastor Dave and we went all the way across and all the way up and I said, define holiness. I don't know what your definition would be, but I want to give you something to think about. The Bible calls a few things holy that makes me scratch my head. One of the commandments is remember the Sabbath day and keep it. Everybody say the word holy. holy. Now, now, wait a second. If holiness is moral perfection... How can a day be morally good or bad? How can a day make a good choice or a bad choice? When God says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, what does that mean? I mean, if holiness is moral perfection, then i got to tie one day of the week up to a tree and say, don't you be lying to me. Don't you be cheating on that exam at school. Don't you be looking at things you ought not be looking at day. Hey, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, 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 you better behave. 
Moses goes up to a bush that is consumed by the presence of God and God speaks out of the bush and he says, Moses, take off your shoes because the ground you stand on is holy. Now, if holiness is moral perfection, then how can a day have any moral value to it? It can't make a good choice or a bad choice. God, he told Moses, when you make the articles that will be used for service in the temple and tabernacle, he said, those tabernacle articles, he said, they are, everybody say the word, holy. Now, wait a second. How can tongs be holy if holy is moral perfection? Because tongs can't make a good decision or a bad one. That day of the week was holy. Not because it was morally good or bad. It was holy because it belonged to him. And that ground that Moses was standing on was called holy. Not because it had a good day or a bad day morally. It was holy because that was his ground. And those tongs and all those utensils used for the service of the Lord in the tabernacle were holy, not because they were good tongs or bad tongs, but because they were His tongs. Yeah. And I stand up here today on this platform. I'm talking April. What is it? It ain't April. It's March 27th, 2016. Easter 2016. I stand here holy. Not because I'm morally perfect. If you ask my wife, she'll tell you I am way far from that. I came out of prayer one day mad and aggravated and I said something I shouldn't have said. She said, how can you be so mean coming out of prayer? I said, imagine how mean I'd be if I wasn't praying right now. <laughs> I stand here today holy, not because I'm morally perfect. I stand holy because I belong to Jesus and He calls me special. Yeah. yeah. So... Christianity is not about perfection. It's about affection. It's about who has your heart. Now you said, Jason, you said in 20 minutes you're going to get through the Word of God. Well, let's jump in. Genesis chapter 3. we got a lot of ground to cover. Genesis chapter 3. God looks down, searches for Adam, walks through the garden, can't find him. Adam and Eve have sinned. They've done the one thing God said not do. And look at what happens in Genesis 3. Then the Lord said, Behold, man has become like one of us. Now he's thinking, he's consumed with knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach his hand out and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. We got a problem. We got to do something. We can't have Adam eating the tree of life and living forever. Look at the next verse. Therefore, the Lord God sent Adam out of the garden of Eden to work the ground which he, from which he was taken. He drove out man... And at the east end of the Garden of Eden, he placed an angel with a flaming sword that turned in all directions, guarding the way to the tree of life. Let me ask you a question. Why did God not want Adam to eat of the tree of life and live forever? I thought the reason why Jesus came was to give us eternal life. John 17 says, this is eternal life, that you would know God and the one that God sent, Jesus Christ. I thought Jesus came to give us eternal life. He did, but Jesus hadn't come yet. So why did God not want Adam to eat of the tree of life and live forever? Get this. He didn't want him to live forever in that state of brokenness. God, God said man has fallen and he is living in a state of regret and shame and humiliation. And I don't want him to live in shame forever. Somebody today, listen, I have been praying and there's been a hundred plus people praying all week long for every person that walks through the door today. And here's been our prayer for you. That if you walk in here today and you're loaded up with shame and regret and humiliation, you don't have to carry that home today because Jesus Christ loves you. And He can free you from that. Now, God says we can't have him living like that forever. And now get this. We go two chapters. Genesis chapter 5. You say, dude, you got some ground to cover. I do. But two chapters later, we have something that's always messed with me. It, it, I've always wondered about it. It's, it's a list in Genesis 5 of ten names. And I don't, maybe, maybe you're like me. Maybe you're not. But have you ever been reading the Bible and there's like this. Matthew is a good example. You open up the New Testament. Matthew 1. So-and-so begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so, and then they begat so-and-so. And you're like, man, why is that even in there? I mean, it's like, you're wasting paper, Lord. I mean, I'm sorry, can I say that? But it's like, do we need that? Well, two chapters after man falls, there's a list, Genesis 5, of ten names. 
And it's the genealogy of mankind from the first man to the fall and to the flood of Noah. So, a list, ten names from the first man of creation to the flood of Noah. Here's the list. Genesis chapter 5. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Ten names. Here's what's crazy. If you look at the Hebrew definition of each name, and in the Bible, people's names carried great meaning and significance. So if you look at the Hebrew definition of those ten names, you get the story of how God planned to fix this mess right here. Here's the definition of each name. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Canaan means sorrow. Mahalel means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enosh means teaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means the despairing. Noah means comfort. Now here's what's crazy. If you take the meaning of each person's name, the ten names, the ten meanings, and you put them beside of one another, starting with the first, ending with the last, it makes a sentence. And it's the mystery behind two chapters after we fell how this was going to get fixed. Listen to the sentence. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down. Oh man, somebody shout on that one right there. Teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort. Man, whoo, somebody, somebody get crazy on that, man. Whoo. Man. Oh man, if I had a white handkerchief, I'd be flapping it in the wind right now. God knew that you and I would end up with a messy life. And before you were even born, before you were even born, two chapters after Adam messed the whole thing up, God said, I'm coming and I'm going to fix that. Man. Now, let's take a big leap. We're going to take one huge jump and we're going to go to the New Testament. The New Testament, Jesus comes on the scene. And when Jesus comes, there's two religious groups and they control the way everybody sees God. Those two religious groups, they are the filter through which everybody processes all God thoughts. The two groups are these groups. One's the Sadducees and the other's the Pharisees. I'm going to tell you the difference between the two. The Sadducees, they held tightly to the first five books of the Old Testament. They called those books, and still today, call those books the Torah. Everybody say the Torah. Now, the Torah is the law of Moses. Moses wrote the first five books. In the book of Exodus, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Now, how many commandments were in the garden? Everybody? One. So I know you're with me. Everybody, hold up one there. One. There was one commandment. And it was a good one, right? Don't think about right and wrong, good and evil. That's a good commandment. But then in Exodus, the second book of the first five, there are ten. Everybody say ten. Ten Ten commandments. Now, I mean, we couldn't get one right. I I doubt we can get ten right, right? But then you turn to the book of Leviticus. It's one of the first five books. And in that book, oh my goodness, there's a billion. Do not, you better, you better not ever. Thou shalt not, you shall, you better, you got to get that right, but you better not ever do that. If, if, listen, if you can't sleep at night, open up Leviticus chapter 1, five verses in, you'll be snoring, man. It is like full of do's and do nots. Now, there was one command in the garden, and it was a beautiful command, and we couldn't get it right. Now in Exodus, there's ten commandments, and then in Leviticus, there are a billion commandments. Well, the Sadducees, they held tightly to every one of those. The first five books of the Old Testament, they held tightly to it. But the Pharisees were different. Because here's what the Pharisees were about. Not only did they hold tightly to the first five books, but they added to the list of rules all the teachings of their preachers, their rabbis. Now, here's what's interesting about that. Their rabbis, their teachers... They had broken down the commandments of God into 613 rules. That's messy. That right there is a lot of... There's a lot of broken end tables and coffee tables over that. 613 rules, 248 commandments, 365 restrictions you cannot do's, 
And to top all that off, they made 1,522 edits, corrections, or additions to the law itself. There were 39 specific acts that one could not do on the Sabbath. And if you want to read some good reading, go home today and read Numbers chapter 15. There was a guy that got caught on the Sabbath picking up sticks. And they caught him. They didn't know what to do with him because they said, This looks like work to me and you can't work on the Sabbath, so what do we do? You know what they did? They killed him. Not only did they kill him, they killed his kids and his wife. Can you imagine appearing before God and St. Peter saying, What brought you here? Dude, I was picking up sticks. I was picking up some sticks. And they killed me for it. Your people killed me for it. And uh, let me introduce my children and my wife. They killed us all. We picked up sticks. Didn't rob a bank. Didn't rob a bunch of camels, you know, on their way to Jericho. We just picking up sticks and they killed us. Here's the deal, guys. Why do the Pharisees do that? Why, why were the Pharisees so consumed with rules? Because something deep inside of you and me, all of us, something deep inside of us says that we're responsible for fixing all these wrong turns. In all of us, there's this desire to earn our way. But you don't earn heaven, you enter heaven. Amen. <laughs> so, Jesus comes on the scene. It's really complicated, it's really messy. And Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus says three words that I love. What are the first three? Come to me. Now, I want you to think about that. We were all a mess, and without Jesus, we all are a mess. He comes on the scene, and they've taken Ten Commandments in the first five books of the Old Testament. And man, they have got commandments. There's so many that you and I couldn't remember them all if we had to. And in all that mess, Jesus did not say, think about what he didn't say. He didn't say, get away from me. Get away from you. You disgust me. I cannot believe you would, and not just once, but over and over. You have violated all of my commandments. You just repulse me. I just get nauseous thinking about what you've done. Get away from me. He didn't say that. In all of this mess, Jesus says three words that are so beautiful. What are they? Come to me. No matter where you are right now. Jesus says those three words to you. Come to me. And now listen, listen to the rest of it. He says, all of you who are what? Weary. Weary. Now some translations say in the New King James, the King James says, all you who labor. And I love this translation, the New Living, because weary is probably a better choice of words because it sounds like in the King James, come to me all you who labor. What, what, who's he talking to? Everybody who's a part of the labor force? You got a job? You work 40 hours a week? Come to me? No. No, he's not talking to people who are working in a career or on a job, but working at this. Come to me, all you who are weary. Weary of what? Weary of this mess. Trying to fix it. Trying to get right. Trying to, to, to man, i got to live right. I, I, I can't do that anymore. I, I have to start doing that. i got to start singing songs that I really don't care for out of a, you know, and, and then i got to start helping old ladies uh, across the street. And, you know, i got to... I, I just I can't cheat on my history exam. You know, it's just this consumption of I gotta I gotta get this right. Come to me, all you who are weary, and what does he promise? I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Man. Maybe you're here today and you need rest. I've got a personal observation I want to give you real quick. And here it is. When I study scripture. I realize that all of us, we're all, we all want to make heaven our home. And we all, every single person wants to know God. Even the person who claims to have the hardest of hearts, or even the person that doesn't even say, they, they say, I don't even believe in God. The truth of the matter is, we all want to know God. We have a God-sized hole in our heart that only He can fill. But we can all get there by one of two means. And one is living right. One is, I'm going to fix this. This, I, I don't care how long i got to stay up. I don't care how mad I get. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to live right. And the other is loving right. And here are my personal observations. If my focus, if the focus of my faith, if the focus of my Christianity is living right, the irony is I seldom do. 
Not only do I seldom do, but I live a life that is frustrated and agitated and, and just I'm, I'm full of anger. Have you ever met church people and, and thought, man, them some angry people, them some unfriendly people, man. Y'all, y'all ever known some church people that looks like they've been baptized in pickle juice? They just sour people. And you think, man, why, shouldn't you be happy? Shouldn't you have some joy? Shouldn't you have some love? And sometimes the people who should have the most love have the least amount of love. Why? Because living right's my focus. And when I focus on living right, here are some observations. Number one, I'm angry, exhausted. I'm unsure of my salvation. I'm, I'm a pain to be around. I want to argue with other Christians over non-essentials. I knew a guy one time that left the church he attended... Because the church he attended partnered with Franklin Graham. And for Christmas, Franklin Graham pulled an 18-wheeler truck into their community and gave away a 1,000 gifts to a 1,000 children in their community. And somebody in the church was dressed up like St. Nicholas. And they left and they said, they said, listen, I don't believe in St. Nick. And that's paganism. Christmas is all about Jesus. I said, Bubba, I don't believe in him either. But listen, if I can dress up like St. Nick, give away some gifts and win some people to Jesus, suit me up. 365 days a year. But, but when my focus is being right and living right, I'm going to argue with other Christians over non-essentials. I'm going to leave a church because we had an Easter egg hunt. I'm going to leave because the Easter bunny. I went to a church called Home Easter 2016. The Easter bunny was out there taking pictures with kids. That is paganism. <laughs> we know what today's about. It is about a risen Savior. Somebody say amen. But you know, let, me, let me share this with you. I think... It, the world is full of darkness, right? We know that. Turn on the news. It's full of darkness. But we can approach the darkness in one of two ways. Number one, we can curse it. Curse the darkness. Or number two, we can bring the light. Yes, right. now, now, do this experiment when you go home today. Go in one of your closets deep into your house. Turn off all the lights and just start cursing the darkness. I cannot believe how dark this place is. Look at the blackness. Look at, look at, oh, this is horrible. I curse you, you dark room. I curse this darkness, this blackness. And watch and see what happens. Or bring the light and see what happens. When I bring the light, the darkness has to flee. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Woo. So... When the focus of my faith is living right, I'm cursing the darkness, man. But when the focus of my faith is loving right, man, I can get along with everybody. You remember the day you got saved, those of you who followed Jesus? Man, the day I came up from that altar, that thing was covered in snot, and my heart was covered in love, man. I just wanted to, I loved everybody. I didn't care who you were. I loved you. It didn't matter what you said, what you did. I loved you. And so when the focus of our faith is Loving right, we love everybody, even if they don't agree on all the non-essentials. And here's the other thing. When I love right, I find myself living right. Wow. I'm not going to earn heaven. I'm going to enter heaven. Now listen to what John chapter 6 says, verse 28. There's a group of people that come to Jesus and they say, What shall who do? What shall we do? That we can work the works of God. See, there's that battle again. Man, this is about me. The focus is me. You tell me what I need to do. Give me the formula. Give me the recipe. I'll do it. And I'm going to do the works of God. Here's the deal. With Jesus, I can do anything. Because He is the one getting the job done. Without Him, I can't do anything. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, What good thing can I do? There's this battle in us to earn our way. The truth of the matter is, the good news today is Jesus and only Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this. The idea that I can, on my own, fix all these wrong turns. That idea is dripping with pride and religious arrogance. And God left us no room to doubt how He feels about pride. In Proverbs, God says, I resist the proud heart, and I give grace to those who are humble. I can't get this right, but Jesus can. I want to share a story with you, and then we're going to end in the book of Revelation. 
There's a guy that goes to church here, he and his wife, and they are a part of Grace Food Ministry. They help out with Grace every month. His name is Marshall Allen. His wife, Debbie, leads a small group here. And Marshall was like me and like a lot of you. He made a lot of wrong turns when he was young, and those wrong turns became addiction. But Marshall ended up in prison, in a state prison. He did a stretch. Not only did he end up in prison, but before prison, he was expelled from every school in Knox County. That's a bad dude, ain't it? He made a few wrong turns. Every school, he was not welcome in any school in this county. And then, a few years later, he ended up in prison. Now, you have to know Marshall to appreciate this story. But Marshall, when he was growing up, his mom did something every year on his birthday. It was a tradition at Marshall's house. From his first birthday until he went to prison, Marshall's mom did the same thing. She never one time, never one year did she ever make him a birthday cake or buy him one. But she would always bake a few, not just one, but a few cherry pies. Because he loved cherry pie. Somehow at one year old, she knew he was going to love cherry pie. So every year for his birthday, every single year, everybody look at your neighbor and say, every year. Every year she made him a bunch of cherry pies. And every year on his birthday, she'd go into Marshall Allen's room and she'd wake him up and she'd say, Marshall, Marshall, it's your birthday. It's all you can eat cherry pie day today. Every year, and then he went in prison. Now, I am not exaggerating. I'm not making this story up. This is the way God is. His first birthday rolled around. At breakfast, he gets in line at the chow hall, and the cook makes an announcement. And he says, fellas, he says, I've been here for decades. I've worked in this institution for quite some time. This week, we had a special delivery. Because of somebody's kindness, we received a truckload of something special. And today, guys, I just want you to know, it's all you can eat cherry pie day today. And Marshall said his knees buckled. And he said he folded over and collapsed on all fours and started to weep violently. It was his birthday. Nobody knew what was going on. They thought he lost his mind. They didn't know it was his birthday. Even if they knew, they didn't care. He's in prison. He has flushed his life down the toilet. He's nothing to them. But he's something to God. And so on his birthday, God brings a truckload of cherry pies. I want you to know something. God loves Marshall and God loves you. Marshall said he got up and he went to his cell and he slammed his cell. And he said, I got down by my bed and he said, I cursed God. He said, I cursed him. He said, I said, how could you love me? Why do you love me? Why won't you leave me alone? Don't you see where I am? Don't you see this mess? Stop loving me. And he said he fell asleep. He said lunchtime he went back to the chow hall. And the cook repeated the same drill. He said he went back for dinner. There was still cherry pie. Same announcement. It's all you can eat cherry pie day to day. Here in that story a God. Who would come down no matter how messy you were, are, or have been. And love you anyway. Now there is a word that is used to describe Jesus. And it's used 210 times. And I love this word. It's all over scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. You'll find this word 210 times in the Bible. And it describes Jesus. It's the word redeem. Redeemer. Redemption. And that word is a beautiful word because it means to make everything new again. It means to bring everything back to the way it was in the beginning. How was it in the beginning? Simple. A garden like heaven, place full of pleasure, God walking with man, and God saying, don't worry about anything, just get close to me. 210 times. Now, I told you we'd go from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to end right now the last chapter of the last book of the Bible. We started at the beginning. We're ending at the end. 
Jesus, these are the last few words he says. Revelation 21 and 5. Behold, I make all things new. Come on. Mm. God, thank you. Jesus today can make you new again. Right where you are. I want everybody to bow their head with me.